Well, good Sunday morning, church. It's great to see you on this wonderful, crisp, cool morning. Are you ready to worship today? Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing about the wonderful grace of Jesus today. Let's praise his name. Let's sing. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise be? Transgressions greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost. By it I have been pardoned, saved to the uttermost. song was a lot of fun. <laughs> I've never heard that before, but the, the rhythm and stuff, I was trying to keep up. Well, hey, good morning, everybody. So happy to see you. My name is Brad, the pastoral intern. I want to come up and just give a few announcements for us. Uh, we, got a, we got a decent amount this morning. First of all is if you could check in for us, that would always be appreciated. Helps us keep in contact, helps us uh, keep connected with each other. You can see that info right there behind me of how to check in. You can do it on your phone or the little blue slip in the seat right in front of you. It would be very appreciated if you could do that. I've got three announcements for us today. The first one is completely personal bias and is a shameless plug, but a new Wednesday Bible study group is starting, led by me. Yay. It is called Coffee Talk. And what it is, is it's supposed to be a, a down-to-earth conversation about biblical topics that are relevant today. Ministry happens a lot not in the church, and so this is a class that's supposed to just, we're supposed to talk about what it's like to do ministry outside when you're having a cup of coffee with someone and you want to talk about the Bible. Very exciting. It's going to start two Wednesdays from now. 
Our next announcement is that summer camp is coming up. Crazy because it's like 40 degrees outside or something. Uh, students just need to text camp, and kids need to, need to text Centra Kid to be a part of that. Camp was life-changing during my time in, in student ministry. Really encourage it. Our last announcement is that family dedication is next Sunday where, where parents get to say that they are a, a, a house for the Lord and they plan to raise their children up that way. If you are interested in that, please email Judy at Stetson.Church if you are interested. That's it for announcements. I want to pray for us and we'll continue in worship. God, you're, you're great and you're mighty. And, and God, you have so much going on in the world that, that we might see two directions. But God, you have a, a thousand available. Lord, I, I pray for our worship today that we just remember how, how great and how mighty you are. God, that we, we come to you humbly. And God, we come to you so, so grateful that you want to be a part of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen. Isaiah 12, 2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. We're going to sing a song right now that talks about having faith in God and trusting in God. And let me invite you to stand with us as we lift our voices together. Let's sing, Have Faith in God. Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all the way you have trod. Never alone are the least of his children. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches o'er his own. Oh 
Would you please be seated? to see you this morning. So grateful that we uh, have the privilege of being together. It's, it's a little chilly outside. I'm going to consider, you know, usually I talk about things being Florida cold. That means it's not really cold. It's just Florida cold. I think this is just cold. It's just cold out there. So, hey, I am so glad you're here. Uh, and we, we are excited about what God's doing in the life of our church and uh, excited about being able to share uh, a good bit of, uh, with you about that. We uh, have a really exciting event that's happening on our campus this weekend uh, called the Night to Shine Boutique. And that is where all of our Night to Shine VIPs get a chance to come and shop for formal wear for Night to Shine, uh, which is coming up. They shop for that for free. So it is a donation. And uh, our community comes together to provide all of those dresses and suits and formal wear, and it really is a really exciting opportunity. So uh, that's happening right here in this building uh, yesterday and today, and so just wonderful opportunities of being able to serve our community. In the mindset of serving our community, I have something really exciting to share with you. Most of you remember that on the last Sunday of the year, we took our 53rd Sunday offering. You remember that, right? And that 53rd Sunday offering is going to be split into two. Half of that we're going to use to, uh, to kind of start some projects uh, here on our campus, a couple of major projects that we have uh, coming up. And then the rest of it we're going to give away. We're going to share that with other ministries um, in our community. We have highlighted those ministries in our foyer. There are some uh, brochures that you can pick up and just opportunities for us to, to uh, care for others and to support others and to fund others. Well, I know that you are curious because we've been talking about this for quite a while and you have been so giving and so sacrificial. Church, on the last Sunday of the year for our 53rd Sunday offering, you gave $103,545. That is awesome. So, so good. Thank you for being so faithful. Yeah, that looks good. I like that. That is really amazing. Thank you for being such a faithful church. Thank you for being so giving and generous to others. So yes, we'll take half of that and we'll use it right here on our campus and then we'll take the other half and we're just going to give it away and let other people use that and uh, to the glory of God. So thank you church for being so faithful and so giving uh, to, to, this, uh, to this church and to our community. You are a very, very faithful church. So celebrate that, but don't tell anybody in the second or third service, okay? You got it? We got to share that with them when they come. Hey, this week, uh, this, this, uh, this series we're talking talking about with the, uh, with the um, gospel BC, the thing that we want to make sure that you know by the end of this series, if you don't know anything else, we want to be sure that you know the answer to this question. What is the gospel? 
What is the message of Jesus? What does it, how can we whittle it down to a simple statement that we understand what did Jesus do and what is the message of the gospel? We, have, we talked about this last week. Do you remember? Let's try it again. The message of the gospel is this, that Jesus lived a perfect life and died on the cross for my sin and rose again. Some of you did that, did, did well. You're, you're answering with me. You want to answer with me? Here we go. All on three. One, two, three. Jesus lived a perfect life and died on the cross for my sin and rose again. Amen? Amen. The fact that Jesus lived a perfect life and died on the cross, not just for himself, but he died for my sin. He paid the price for my sin. And he rose again. He died paying the price. He rose again, meaning that that is available to me, and it grants me eternal life. Well, today, as we continue to talk about that, I, I want to share with you that when I was a kid, I loved to read, but the reason I loved to read was because of the message and the story that were available, but I also loved to read because of the pictures. No book was a really good book unless it had good pictures. Even as a 49-year-old man, sometimes I really like to read a book that has a few pictures because that makes the book shorter. And it allows us to see things that maybe we wouldn't see in our mind's eye. I like the fact that I like when, when, a, when an author or an illustrator takes a story and, and illustrates it so that we can see what was the author seeing or what was the intent in what was being described. I love to see pictures. We're going to see a picture of the gospel Today, If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. While you're turning there, let me give you just a little bit of background of what I want to talk to you about today. Abram, who eventually becomes Abraham, and let me just go ahead and apologize in the beginning. Today, I promise you, I am going to call this person in the Bible both Abram and Abraham because my brain just won't, it's, it's like I just can't keep it from, from transitioning between those two names. His name was Abram. God changed his name to Abraham. Abram was a man from Ur who had a family, a wife, had lots of belongings, lots of livestock, lots of riches, and God spoke to Abram and said, I want you to go to a place that I will show you. He didn't give him a destination. He didn't give him an end journey. He didn't give him ways or Google Maps or anything else. He just said, when you get to the place that I want you to be, I will show you that that's the place. So Abram, being a very faithful man, said, all right. And he picked up his wife and he picked up his belongings and he picked up everything that he owned and he began to walk. And he walked from Ur all the way to what we know today as Israel, about 1,400 miles on foot with a wife behind him saying, are you lost? Don't we need to stop and ask for directions? And Abram was saying, no, I'm not lost. I know exactly where I am. I'm right here, and I'm right there, and then I'm right there. Abram was a faithful, faithful man. And he finally got to the place where, where God showed him. He said, this is where you're supposed to be. This is the land that I have promised you, and you're going to be great. Abram had a lot of things to happen to him, but we're going to pick it up, pick up the story in Genesis chapter 15. Listen to what it says. It says, after these things, after all the stuff that had happened to Abraham, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Abram's probably thinking, when? It's been a while. 1,400 miles, this is a really difficult journey. You're going to be, you're, my reward is going to be great, wonderful. But Abram said, he finally kind of re responded, he said, oh, Lord God, what will you give me for I continue childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. 
And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And Abram was sitting there going, I don't have a son. How can my son be my heir? Because I don't have a son yet. And he brought him outside. God brought Abram outside. And he, and, he, and he said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And it says, and he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Abram has gone on this long journey and he's looking up at God and he's saying, how in the world can you bless me? I don't have a child. You see, it was typical that the blessing of a family would be through the passing of the blessing through an heir, through a son. God takes him outside and says, look up at the stars. Have you ever been out on a really, really dark night? I mean, we don't, we don't get a lot of that in our immediate area. Some of you may live out of town a little bit, and you have an opportunity to, to look up, but most of us live in these neighborhoods with street lights and street lamps and front door lights and all of that kind of thing. And, and when you look up, you might see a few stars, but if you've ever been out, out, and looked up into the sky and seen that there are so many specks of light in the sky, the stars are way too numerous to count. God said, I'm going to make your offspring like those stars. Can you imagine that moment? It says that Abram believed God, and God counted it to him, his belief. He said, because you believe me, you're a righteous man, Abram. The story goes on in verse 7. It says, And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? How am I to be sure? I believe you, but, but can you make me sure? So he said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a cow. A female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. Thank you for the birds. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. I have one word for this passage of Scripture. Ew. He takes these animals and, and he splits them into half, into carcasses. And he, and he moves them, one, one on one side and, and one on the other. So you got half of a cow over here and half of a cow over here. You got half of a, of a lamb over here. You got half, half of a goat, half of a goat, half of a ram, half of a ram. This is a really interesting passage of Scripture, isn't it? Aren't you glad you came to church? This actually was the beginning of a very ancient covenant ritual. It was called the cutting of the covenant. And, and when they would do this, this was not, uh, this was not something that was, that was uh, unique here in Scripture. It was something that was very common in scriptural times. They would literally take animals and they would divide them in half. And in their, their, their inward statement would be, May it be to me if I don't keep the commitment that I'm making to you right now. In other words, if I don't live up to my end of the bargain, split me in half like we have these animals. It's pretty ew, but it's also a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? It's, a, it's called cutting the covenant. Verse 12, it says, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Abram, I told you I was going to mess it up, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. You Bible scholars, what was he talking about? He was talking about Egypt. God gives Abram details. 
He says, you're going to have this land, but oh, there will be a time that you actually will not be here for about 400 years. He's giving him details. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve in the form of 10 plagues. And, and, and afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. This is all, this all happens and comes true. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they, your offspring, your, your, uh, your family, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. There is a lot to preach there. There is a lot to talk about. But honestly, the thing that I want you to really focus in on is the fact that God is making a commitment to Abram and saying, not only here's the commitment, but I'm going to give you a few details. I'm going to be specific. I'm making a commitment to you. I'm making a covenant with you. You asked me how things were going to turn out. I'm telling you how they're going to turn out. And oh, by the way, not only is it going to turn out well for you and all of your family is going to possess this land, but they're going to have to go away for a little while. You're going to live a, not, a nice old age and you're going to be buried in a good place. Your family's going to go away. They're going to be away for 400 years. They're going to come back and everything's going to be great. They're going to possess this land. God is making a commitment. And then in verse 17, we get to kind of the crux of the moment. In verse 17, it says, When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. Verse 18, On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. Abram, sorry, I keep saying it, saying to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. It goes on to talk about all the different people that were in the land at that time. But the crux of the, of the statement is when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. So I, I told you that, that, makes, that makes complete sense, right? Y'all got it, right? Understand? Good message? It's a little confusing, isn't it? You see, what happens in this moment is, is actually a, a picture of the gospel. What has happened in this moment is that, is that God, in, in speaking to Abram, God is telling him what's going to happen. And then he says, bring these carcasses and, and put half of them on one side and half of them on the other side. And then... What would typically happen is the person that was on one side of the covenant would get on one end of that little pathway that was created, the bloody, nasty pathway. He would get on one end, and the other one would get on the other end, and they would walk towards each other, and they would meet in the middle, and maybe they would do a secret handshake or something, a high five, and they would say, see, our commitment has been made. The covenant has been made. What we said we're going to do, and if we don't do it, may we look like these guys. But instead of Abram being on one end and God being on the other end, we see a picture of God walking through the, the covenant land, the covenant ground by himself, carrying a flaming torch and a flaming pot. It's a, it's a picture of a physical manifestation of God before God had a bodily form. Now, we... We know that eventually God has a bodily form, right? We just celebrated the birth of Jesus, the incarnation of God the Son. When God shows up in bodily form, it is something called a Christophany, meaning it is, a, it is an Old Testament appearance of Christ before his birth in Bethlehem. This right here is a Christophany. It is a picture of Jesus coming in bodily form saying, I want to show you that the covenant will be kept. But Abram is over on the side, passed out. He's over on the side in a deep sleep or a, a state of, of, of misunderstanding. So Christ walks through the covenant ground on his own. I want you to see this because it's really important. Jesus, God, is making a covenant with Abram 
that has nothing to do with Abram's side of the, of the deal. Because Abram's on the side of sleep. He's passed out. He's over there. So God walks through, in the person of Jesus, God walks through the covenant ground making a promise to Abram that Abram will one day inhabit and and Abram's people will one day inhabit this promised land. It It has nothing to do with an agreement of you keep your side, I'll keep my side. It has everything to do with the fact that God is saying I will keep the covenant all to myself. I know this is a little confusing. Let me say it simply. What is happening in this moment is God is saying, Abram, you will get the reward. I'll do all the work. We're getting closer, aren't we? You get the reward. I'll do the work. It's not about you living up to my commitment to you. My commitment to you is regardless, I'll do the work, you get the reward. That actually sounds pretty familiar. Do you know what it sounds like? It sounds like Jesus lived a perfect life and died on the cross for my sin and rose again. You get the reward He did the work. You get the benefit. He gives the effort. You get eternal life. He pays the price. You get heaven. He makes the sacrifice. You get the benefit. He does the work. He... God is saying in this moment, he is showing us a picture of the gospel. He is showing us that that Jesus eventually, I mean, years and years and years from now, this is a picture of the message of the gospel, that Jesus will live a perfect life and die on the cross for my sin and rise again, that Jesus will do all the work. All I do is get the benefit. Man, that's awesome. Man, that's awesome. How much do we do when we, when we receive the message of Jesus and accept Jesus as our Savior, how much do we do to earn that salvation? Nothing. We don't earn anything. We are granted it. We are gifted it. By the love of Jesus, by the sacrifice that he makes for us on the cross. Basically, this is what I'm saying, and this is what God is saying here, that salvation has already been accomplished. The price has already been paid. All you have to do is receive it. I'm reminded of the passage in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, where it says, but God shows his great love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you know what that means? That means we were on the side of the covenant asleep. We were over there in a trance. We didn't do anything. But he did everything. Now I want to show you one more thing, one more, one more bonus here. I told you I like, I like pictures, and this is a great picture. I want you to see this. It's really important that you see this. I'll tell you, this is not original with me. Well, it's not original with me because it's the Bible. But it's not original with me to see this. The first time I ever heard somebody preach this passage of Scripture was years and years and years ago at a student camp. And it just, when, when he preached what I'm about to share with you, it absolutely blew my mind. Because there is a picture here that, that is, is, even, is even better. Check it out. So, We've got this picture of, of these, these carcasses. Half of the carcasses over here, half of the carcasses over here. You got it? And then we've got, and then we've got uh, uh, this, this flaming torch that goes uh, you know, all the way from this end all the way to that end. And that's the picture. Do you got, you got it? Okay, you don't got it. All right, so let me just show you one more time, okay? 
So we have this, this, this idea, this image. I need, you to, I need you to be there with me, okay? So think about it. I know it's a little nasty, but be there. Think about it with me. You've got carcasses over on this side and carcasses over on this side. And between those carcasses, we have Jesus walking between those carcasses. So we've got some carcasses here and carcasses here and Jesus walking through. Right? Some of you are getting it. Let me, let me show you one more time, okay? See it. You've got carcasses over on this side. You've got carcasses over on this side. And in the middle, Jesus walks. Do you see it now? Is it not a beautiful thing that in Genesis 15, in a promise to Abraham, where Abraham's over on the side not doing anything, that we have a picture of Jesus walking the cutting of the covenant, showing us a picture of the cross of Calvary. The message of the gospel is not new. It didn't happen when Jesus showed up. The message of the gospel has been around for all of eternity, for all of, all of the the. the History of God's word. From the beginning, God made a plan. God accomplished a plan. From the beginning, God moved in a powerful way. We have to remember this. We have to remember this, that the covenant is not kept by our own good doing. The covenant is not kept by us being the right people. The covenant is not kept because we think we're some kind of amazing people and and we do all the right things and we make the right moves and we act the right way. The covenant is not kept that way. The gospel is not about our behavior. The gospel is about a promise. And friends, Jesus, the Son of God, is the promise. He is the promise Hear this, Jesus was the promise for Abraham, and Jesus is the promise for you. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how terrible you've acted, no matter how much you believe, no matter how much you doubt, no matter who you are, no matter what your bank account looks like, no matter if you're on time or everything is messed up, no matter if your life is a big old pile of shambles, Jesus, and only Jesus, is the promise for you. He gave his life to promise you that all you have to do is receive him. Have you given your life to the one who made the promise? All you have to do is receive him. Wow. The gospel illustrated. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for images like that. Thank you, God, that we can see it. Thank you that you give us that. And we have the privilege of being able to to know the, the work that you have done the picture that you have painted and the opportunity that we have in our lives. God, I thank you. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for his giving his life on the cross. I thank you that that was his intent ever since the fall of man in the garden. And God, it is our privilege of being able to trust you And I pray that you will just continue to show us that in our lives. Let us trust you and believe in you. As you continue to pray, I just want to give you an opportunity to respond to this message. Have you truly given your life to Jesus? I'm not talking about being a member of a church. I'm not talking about just being baptized. I'm not talking about living a good life. Have 
you given your life to Jesus? Have you trusted him? Have you believed in him? Like truly, deep down in your heart, is he your savior? If you've never given your life to Jesus, I'd love to lead you in a prayer of accepting him as your savior. Today, in the quietness of the moment, I'm not gonna come to you, not gonna embarrass you, not, not gonna point you out, but if right now in this moment, if you would like to give your life to Jesus, would you just slip your hand up in the air? I wanna give my life to Jesus, I wanna do it today. This is your moment. Amen. Anyone else? Amen. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to do it right now. That's awesome. Yeah. Anybody else? This is your time. Several people already in the room. Have you, do you want to give your life to Jesus? This is your moment. Hey, if you just raised your hand or maybe if you didn't for whatever reason, I just want to lead you in a simple word of prayer of asking Jesus to come into your heart and to be your savior. Would you just, as a matter of fact, we don't believe anybody should pray alone, so we're just all gonna pray with you. Everybody around the room, would you just pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, I come to you a sinner. I know I can't do anything on my own, but I believe that you did everything I need. I believe that you died on the cross for me. Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior and be my Lord. Forgive me of my sins and help me to live for you from this point on. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, friends, if you were one of those who raised your hand and prayed that prayer at, in, in these next few moments as we sing this song or at the end of the service, we would love to talk with you about what God's doing in your life. That's a first step. To pray that prayer is a first step, but it's only the first step. We want to give you an opportunity to take a second and a third and a fourth. If God is working in your heart, let this be a time of commitment. Let's all stand and let's sing this closing song together. Let's sing together. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where'er you go, precious name. Oh, how sweet hope of earth and joy of heaven, precious name. Oh, how sweet hope of earth and joy of heaven. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet.